So, at this point, post D23, we've looked at the company as a whole, we've looked at each of the six American Disney parks, each in their own episode, and today we're going to explore movies, streaming, and TV entertainment that's set to be released in the next year or so. Disney's slate of projects prompts some interesting questions, such as, how will the Disney-owned studios work in the years ahead? We will look at some individual films, but the more interesting questions have to do with how these films together attempt to reposition Disney in the post-COVID theatrical market. That is, though we'll look at a few individual titles, we'll mainly be looking at large trends, especially as Disney tries to reposition itself in the theatrical market as that pandemic grows smaller and smaller in the rearview mirror. So, we've got a lot to explore today. If you're ready, let's go. One of the most interesting things about the material screened at D23 was how deeply Disney is now leaning back into its theatrical releases. The last two D23s were far more focused on cinematic quality shows coming to the Disney Plus streamer. Since the last D23 Expo in 2022, investors have sharply moved away from streaming, leaving Disney and other studios in a difficult place. In many ways, the big money deals for streaming happened between 2017 and 2023. Large projects filled with A-list stars, complex special effects, and well-known IP. But that era has now ended. For the most part, Disney Plus and the other streamers are no longer offering contracts worth hundreds of millions of dollars to production companies to create content that's designed to increase the streamer's number of subscribers. And this leaves Disney in a very difficult space. Streaming initially was offered as a partial or even near-full alternative to cinemas. Customers would watch cinema-quality movies and series at home instead of making regular trips to the movies. The studios, in return, would receive all of the monthly subscription dollars instead of splitting the box office take with theaters. This strategy, along with COVID, accelerated the shift, particularly in North America, from people watching movies regularly on the big screen to people watching movies at home, thereby hobbling the century-old studio cinema theatrical partnership that had allowed studios to become massive international companies. During streaming's early years, there were certainly some hits, The Mandalorian, WandaVision, and Loki for Disney+, and Murders in the Building for the Disney-backed Hulu. But this overall plan didn't play out as studios had initially hoped. The revenue from streaming simply didn't pay for a long list of near-endless cinema-quality programming. In response, streamers such as Disney Plus to meet profitability demands from investors needed to cut both the number of expensive shows that they produced and also offer less money to acquire the content that remained. Streaming began as a type of cinema at home experience, but by early 2024, streaming started to look a lot more like traditional cable programming, including in some cases with ads with some occasional cinema quality content sprinkled in. Along with this, Disney Plus and nearly all streamers were forced to aggressively raise subscription prices so that their services would be financially sustainable. In the process, the streaming revolution drove some theater chains into bankruptcy and left other theater chains scrambling for new ways to make money. Last year, for example, Taylor Swift's concert film took in $261 million worldwide. Last week, the re-release of the 15-year-old animated classic Coraline was the fourth highest grossing film at the domestic box office. But there's also this. For the first time since 2019, Disney had two solid billion-dollar-plus box office hits over the summer. Inside Out 2, which in a few days should become the highest-grossing animated film of all time, and Deadpool and Wolverine, 
These were not only Disney's $2 billion hits for the summer, they were the only films from any studio so far to break the billion dollar mark this year. Last year, there were also only two films that broke that same mark, though neither of them were from Disney. They were Super Mario Brothers and the Barbie movie. Compare this, though, to 2019, the last year before the pandemic and before the streaming revolution, in which there were nine films that took in over a billion dollars, seven of which, if you count Spider-Man Far From Home, were either from or deeply connected to Disney. The old theatrical model brought billions of dollars to major studios. The streaming-focused model of the past five years, for the most part, brought losses and also moved customers out of the theaters. The big question now for most every studio is how are they going to correct course back toward large overall revenue and higher profits? What was clear at the D23 Entertainment presentation is that Disney, despite having only two large theatrical hits so far this year, is reorganizing its distribution model in a solid attempt to revive what it can of the pre-COVID theatrical model. In late 2024 and beyond, Disney is going to send a long line of costly films out to theaters. Though this wasn't discussed at the event, it's also clear that Disney is going to continue to increase the time it takes for Disney films to move from theaters to digital to Blu-ray and then streaming. Though Disney hasn't announced the Disney Plus premiere date for Inside Out 2, we now have the physical media date, which is September 10th, so I think we're likely looking at about 100 days or so between Inside Out 2's theatrical release and its appearance on the Disney Plus streamer. Compare that to Encanto back in 2021, which appeared in theaters on November 24th and then showed up on Disney Plus 30 days later on December 24th. And maybe I should throw in a little bit of context here. That was also a period in which most of the world saw a significant rise in COVID numbers. Still, a 100-day theatrical window before streaming for Inside Out 2 is closer. In fact, it's a little longer than the arrangement for most films pre-COVID. So the large question here is this. Can Disney and some other studios pivot most of their frontline content back to theatrical without losing a large portion of their streaming subscribers? And also, are there enough people willing to regularly go back to theaters as they did before 2020 to make this pivot profitable? Disney Animation has just one release for 2024, Moana 2. Pixar also had just one, Inside Out 2. Marvel had one, Deadpool and Wolverine. Lucasfilm has zero. And Walt Disney Pictures, in terms of family releases, will have one, the photorealistic Mufasa. For these areas combined, there are just a total of four large-budget theatrical films being released by key studios that are umbrellaed by the Disney Corporation. In 2025, between these same key studio areas, Disney overall will have 11 big-budget films released to theaters, the largest number by far since COVID. Again, the big question here is this. Will enough people return to their pre-COVID habits of very regularly attending a movie theater in person? From where I sit right now, I don't doubt that many of Disney's upcoming films will be entertaining and engaging. I'm just not sure that after years of staying at home and clicking into the streamers, if there are now enough people willing to leave the house and become monthly theater goers once again. I think the vast majority of people, particularly in North America, find it more enjoyable to watch content at home rather than at theaters, but this is the big concern to follow as we start to move forward toward 2025. After 
After watching trailers and clips for nearly all of Disney's remaining 2024 and 2025 films, I can see their general business strategy. That is, what levers they're pulling to increase their box office numbers. And this brings up an interesting issue for me. The comparison between the Disney company today and the Disney company during Walt's lifetime. At least during the 1950s and 1960s, when Walt's studio was releasing many features each year, Walt simply allowed his current interests to arrange ongoing content theme for his films. During the mid-1960s, Walt was interested in American history. As a result, many Disney films in the mid to late 1950s were straightforward period dramas focused on American history. From Davy Crockett to The Great Locomotive Chase to Westward Ho the Wagons to Johnny Tremaine to Light in the Forest to Ten Who Dared and so on. This interest in American history was also reflected in plans for his park during those same years. The original and never realized concept for New Orleans Square was that it would tell the story of the Louisiana Purchase. And there was that area called Liberty Street that Walt wanted to build behind the Opera House that would tell the story of colonial America an idea that didn't actually come into being until after his life with Walt Disney World in 1971. But Liberty Street at Disneyland was still being planned as far back as 1956. And then in the 1960s, Walt's interest in American history started to decline, partially replaced by a new interest in visual comedy. For the most part, the Disney live-action films of the 1950s are serious dramas. Starting in 1959, though, Walt became interested in lighter material. From the shaggy dog to the absent-minded professor to the parent trap to moon pilot to son of flubber to the misadventures of Merlin Jones and so on. At the park as well. Walt specifically brought on animator Mark Davis to increase the level of comic elements in rides such as the Jungle Cruise and Mine Train Through Nature's Wonderland. And how then did Walt sell such wide-ranging projects to his audience? Well, largely, it was the force of his personality. To put it simply, Walt's presence on screen was so alluring that all he needed to do was to explain why he believed the new Disney film was interesting and a good chunk of his reliable audience would show up and buy a ticket. From European history in the early 1950s to American history in the mid to late 1950s to robust comedies in the 1960s, Walt's enthusiasm, as expressed on screen, helped move his audience from topic to topic. One of the key reasons that the Disney company had such difficulty moving beyond Walt's death into new territory was because so much of the studio's output in the 1950s and 1960s was tightly arranged around the interests that Walt had during that time. I would say that for nearly a dozen years after Walt's death, the studio remained, or rather lingered, in one of Walt's final interest areas, that is, the family comedy, as executives didn't know what Walt would move on to after that. The 1970s are littered with Disney screwball comedies, when surely by 1970, Walt, assuming he had lived that long, would have moved on to some other story themes or areas that interested him. Almost surely, the audience would have followed him. In the 1990s, then-CEO Michael Eisner attempted to occupy Walt's old role of spokesperson for the studio, appearing on TV to introduce shows and films and to explain why he was connected to certain projects. That experiment with Eisner as the new Walt didn't go very well. The big lesson back then was this. Even three decades after Walt's death, he was still irreplaceable. And today, the Disney company still lacks an ongoing, effective, on-screen spokesperson. Bob Iger is a very competent company manager. And I must say, it was a huge relief seeing him on stage this year, as opposed to ex-CEO Bob Chapek at the last D23, as Iger is able to connect with fans using their language. But also, Iger is a business person, not an avuncular presence who you want to invite into your house each week, via TV, to listen to what interests him. 
So without that type of reliable studio figurehead, what now is presently guiding Disney's film production? Well, I believe it's two things. First, if you look at this past summer for all studios and not just Disney, all of the highlights were franchise films. There were the two Disney billion dollar earners, Inside Out 2 and Deadpool and Wolverine, but beneath this there was another wave of strong earners, all of them franchise offerings. Despicable Me 4, Bad Boys, Ride or Die, A Quiet Place, Day One, Twisters, Kingdom of the Planet of the Apes, and Alien Romulus, which was released by Fox, a studio that Disney now owns. The only franchise film that significantly underperformed was Furiosa, A Mad Max Saga. Presently, big-budget franchise films are essentially bankrolling gambles that studios take on new properties. Of course, successful new properties can eventually become evergreen franchises, one strategy of the early streaming area was to experiment with new properties on Disney Plus and then to move those that succeeded over to theaters. The Mandalorian, for example, will eventually give rise to a theatrical film starring Mando and Grogu in 2026. It's a little unclear right now how Disney, outside of Pixar, which has a strong brand following, is going to handle the integration of new original film stories while continuing to move forward with existing narratives. But the big shift here post-COVID for Disney is even a greater emphasis on familiar film properties, reboot sequels in terms of theatrical releases. Second, it's also clear that so far, it's mainly younger people, largely Gen Z, who is actually returning quasi-regularly to in-person movies. According to Audience Solutions, Gen Z, that is those right now between 15 and 24 years of age, makes up 27% of the audience, more than any other age group, even though this same group only makes up 10% of the overall American population. Simply, Gen Z per capita goes to far more in-person movies than any other age group. Disney's plan moving forward clearly is to capitalize on franchise films or well-known remakes, as one key to success right now seems to be the public's previous familiarity with the film's characters, storylines, and world-building elements. I'd also say that Disney's plan is to focus a great deal of its topics on areas that interest Gen Z, which likely means stories that have an audience foothold somewhere between 2000 and 2015. Looking at release schedules from this perspective, I think certain films might have a better chance of succeeding than others. Toy Story 5, for example, hits the nostalgia sweet spot for Gen Z. They clearly remember earlier installments from their childhood. The photorealistic remake of Lilo and Stitch, an animated film from 2002, from this perspective is a little riskier, but only a little, as few members of Gen Z saw the original in theaters, and Stitch hasn't had as strong of a post-film following as other Disney classics such as The Lion King. Lilo and Stitch is still a property that mostly speaks to Gen Z. This is likely also why we're seeing so many live-action remakes or extensions of fairly recent Disney animated films, from Moana to Lilo to Mufasa to Hercules, all of which will soon be coming to theaters. These are all properties that Gen Z is far more familiar with and interested in than earlier animated offerings such as Bambi or The Rescuers or Sword in the Stone and so on. Regardless, I think those two criteria areas define a lot of what was previewed at D23. Sequels, reboots, franchise films for particular properties, with an emphasis on topics that would intrigue Gen Z, which remains the age group most willing to visit theaters once or more per month post-COVID. And this also made the D23 presentation a little odd. In looking around, the audience was largely comprised of people over 30. In fact, I'd say most people there were actually over 40. 
but the screen presentations were largely focused on theatrical offerings that could be enjoyed by anyone, but also with an eye toward what would bring the movie-going Gen Z back to theaters again. And those, I'm pretty sure are the twin pistons that Disney is hoping will drive it back toward a larger success at the box office moving forward. Next, I want to take a look at a few key projects that will be released in the latter part of 2024 and all of 2025, specifically to highlight areas to watch as we move through the next year. Let's start with a unique outlier for 2025, Avatar 3, which has now been titled Fire and Ash. I believe the Avatar films require a special category under the Disney umbrella. Disney animation has a place in my personal imagination and thought life, as does Star Wars and to some extent Marvel. I've enjoyed both Avatar movies, and I think Pandora at Animal Kingdom is one of the most impressive areas of themed design anywhere in the world. But the Avatar stories don't live in my mind in the same way that do other movies or books. I don't think I'm alone here. Earlier this month, I spent three days at D23, which was filled with cosplay participants. I saw at least five people dressed as Cuella de Vil, at least five people dressed as Sleeping Beauty, and there were a few else's as well. I lost track of the number of Mandalorians, but it was a lot. I saw Lokis and Captain Americas. I saw a bunch of people bounding as Donald Duck. I forget the number, but the duck was popular this year because he was celebrating his 90th birthday. But I can tell you the exact number of people I saw dressed as the blue-toned Navi from Pandora. That number was exactly zero. Even though none of the cosplayers I saw were drawn toward Avatar characters, the Avatar films were a huge draw at the box office. These are large cinematic film experiences. They are visually detailed and engaging to follow. Both Avatar pictures have felt like grand cinematic experiences, and I'm guessing that other people like me have responded to the majestic visual presentation, even if these movies don't haunt or follow them as do other stories. For this reason, and for a very skillful combination of effects and storytelling, I think that Avatar 3 and the Avatar franchise will continue to do well at theaters. I look at the franchise this way. Avatar films are essentially passion projects, focused on an environmental narrative personally important to the writer-director, and then the finished projects have the special effects sheen and world-building complexities of a high-budget Avengers film. And it's this reason I believe that the films have had such a large audience. Viewers are seduced by the visual wonders presented on screen, along with deeply engaging action set pieces, which become more or less the entry point to explore an environmental outlook important to director James Cameron. This series, I'm pretty sure, is an outlier, but a continually successful one. And because of this, I think that the upcoming third film will be at or near the top of Disney's successes for 2025. But also, I don't think there's any other film franchises out there right now that have a similar combination of personal ethos, storytelling, and visual elements that lead to a high success. And as a side note here, Avatar is in many ways the perfect property to adapt for a theme park. The most memorable aspect in the series, at least for me, isn't the characters, rather the world they explore which is exactly what theme design can deliver in spades in parks. Now on to the live-action remake, or what is sometimes called the photorealistic remake of Disney's first animated feature, Snow White. This is a film with a fair amount of controversy swirling around it right now, most of which has to do with Disney's decision to hire human actors for Snow White, the Queen, the Huntsman, and so on, while creating the dwarfs as CGI representations instead of hiring little people to play the characters. 
The early criticism many months ago was somewhat different. It was that Disney was continuing old stereotypes about people with dwarfism. And here's where some distinctions and the world of cinema get a little messy. The Middle Earth dwarves, that's dwarves with a V, in the Lord of the Rings films are presented as a race of creatures who have magical powers, whereas the animated dwarfs, that's dwarfs with an F, in the original Snow White are typically interpreted as human figures with dwarfism. Dwarfism, in most cases, is attributable to a genetic disorder. In other words, the Lord of the Rings dwarves are fantasy creatures with magical abilities, whereas the dwarfs in Snow White are humans whose height was limited by a genetic disorder. And this is why the Disney film is viewed from a different perspective than that of the Lord of the Rings. But then, on the other hand, much of the more recent criticism for the film, now that images have been released, is that Disney didn't hire little people to portray the dwarfs on screen, but instead used CGI to create them in post-production, which I should point out was the plan they announced a couple years back as well. This then removed employment opportunities for actors who identify as little people. These are the main two issues that the production has garnered over the last couple of years. And it's always hard to tell how discussions on the internet will or won't limit a film at the box office. For example, one of the issues swirling around the recent Bad Boys film concerned how the public viewed Will Smith after he slapped Chris Rock on stage at the Oscars. Despite this, Bad Boys did just fine in theaters. But in terms of the box office, I think the real issue for Snow White is going to be something else entirely. I've seen the new trailer, and I've also seen an extended musical number which was not included in the material released online. The film's visual presentation is interesting to look at. Some absolutely beautiful vistas. The colors are deeply saturated and vibrant, which gives the film a unique vibe, which I liked. But the big hurdle for me was really how unlifelike the CGI dwarfs appeared on screen. I'm pretty sure that these on-screen characters were mocap with some tweaking on top to create highly stylized figures. And without doubt, these dwarfs are more sophisticated in their visual presentation than the human figures in Polar Express. But they share some of that uncanny valley, not quite real elements of the characters in Polar Express, especially in the eyes. Beyond this, the character design of the seven dwarfs in the new film moves far from the Disney animated film from 1937. For that original 1937 animated film, the dwarfs were largely designed and overseen by animator Freddie Moore along with Bill Teitla. Teitla largely worked on Grumpy, particularly how Grumpy's expressions of anger, self-righteousness, and a tendency to isolate himself also revealed elements of empathy and sorrow that more deeply defined his character. In the CGI presentation for the new film, I simply didn't see anything that approached the emotional complexity of the hand-drawn animated scenes from the original Snow White. And beyond that, the 1937 dwarves, largely under Freddie Moore's masterful pencil, were cute and easily lovable. To put this into marketing terms, the 1937 dwarf designs translated easily into plush to characters that children would physically embrace. But the CGI characters in the new version lack all that cuteness. But an even bigger issue is that the natural expressiveness of Rachel Zegler, who plays Snow White, whenever she's in a scene with the dwarves, points out that the dwarves are digitally constructed and makes them seem slightly less real when they stand beside her, which undercuts the continuous dream that this film hopes to create. Each December when I watch Polar Express with my kids, I eventually fall into the narrative. All of the characters on screen have those less than lifelike eyes and slightly stilted gestures, but as there's no human characters on screen to continually remind me that they are digital creations, I eventually go with it. Here though in Snow White, from what I've seen so far, it isn't the same. 
The dwarves stand out too much from the human actors. But again, I want to highlight the amazing color palette in the film. Some of the images, as they are arranged and framed on screen, were stunning, and the music, at least what I heard, was lovely. But I think that this will be Disney's largest big-budget struggle for 2025. It will, though, be interesting to see the entire film when it comes out. Now on to Moana 2. We've talked about this before, but just to highlight it again, Moana 2 was originally conceived as a limited series for Disney+, Plus, until executives shifted it over to a theatrical release, but Moana isn't the only film originally intended for a streamer that Disney sent out into theaters. Alien Romulus, which was produced by Fox, a studio that Disney now owns, was originally arranged as a Hulu original and set to premiere on that streamer. But shortly before the film moved into production, Disney execs re-slotted Romulus for theatrical distribution, where it's now doing very well. At the time that I write this, Alien Romulus has taken in about $230 million, which easily places it in the profitable category. Its production costs were estimated at around $80 million. Once you figure in domestic and international theater splits along with promotion, a reasonable rule of thumb for most films is that a film needs to make roughly two and a half times its production cost at the box office to turn a profit. It can be slightly higher than this if a film has an unusual production budget or if more of a film's revenue is from international receipts, as is the case here. But regardless, this film has already moved into the profitable category and it's still in theaters with digital, Blu-ray and streaming left to go. Moana 2, like Alien Romulus was shifted from a streaming release to a theatrical release. And this seems consistent with the larger Disney attempt to revive the theatrical market in 2024 and 2025, if in fact that's doable at this moment. But the pumping up of the theatrical slate may not be the only reason that these films got shifted from streaming to theatrical. The shift of initial distribution from a streamer to the big screen also seems consistent with Disney's attempt to remove expensive content from streamers' accounts so as to keep the Disney streamers overall profitable. There's actually a good chance that simply shifting Romulus and Moana 2's budgets from the streamers over to theatrical could be the difference between the Disney streamers as a group showing a profit or showing a loss. And I think Disney is presently pushing any reasonable lever to make its streamers show a profit on paper, even if one of these projects doesn't do well theatrically. Disney still has enough of a financial buffer there that theatrical as a whole will produce a profit, whereas the difference over on the streamers between profit and loss is very small. In the third quarter, Disney showed a streaming profit of only $47 million. The production budget for Alien Romulus was $80 million, and admittedly, the budget likely would have been a little lower if it was kept as a Hulu original. The budget for Moana 2, once it was shifted over to theatrical, was reportedly increased by $75 million, a good chunk of that likely for higher quality visuals. But even before this shift, the project was rumored to be somewhere around $100 million in terms of costs. Removing these projects along with their budgets from streaming likely helped the streamers show a profit last quarter. But shifting Moana 2 over to theatrical also creates some interesting problems. Before Moana 2 was shifted over to theatrical, the original plan was to develop a limited Moana series with CG animation for Disney+, Plus, while at the same time developing a live-action remake of Moana for theaters. Now there are two Moana theatrical projects that will premiere roughly within a year and a half of each other. 
In the Moana 2 trailer, some of the effects, such as the water elements, look on par with the original, so I'm guessing as the film went into theatrical, the budget was increased for these elements. But the story, I think, will be the largest difficulty when converting an episodic project, such as a TV series, for a non-episodic presentation, such as a movie. In an episodic production, each series episode typically has its own subplot and ends on a high note or a cliffhanger without completing the overall story. Movies, as you watch them in one sitting, tend to have more of a linear plot that focuses on movements toward the end of the story. Moana 2 takes place three years after the original. Moana is now the leader of the land and sea, and she also has a young sister. The story is arranged around Moana's quest to connect with other island nations. In the words of its lead voice actor, Ali Lee Cravalho, Moana spends her time searching nearby islands for evidence that there just might be people beyond waters she sailed. The key word in there is islands, plural. And to me, that sounds like the structure for a limited series. I take that to mean something along the lines of Moana spends four episodes going to four different islands, each with their own small story. And then for the final two or three episodes, she focuses on a larger adventure with a particularly important or troubling island. And that right there is not an easy narrative structure for an hour and 45 minute film. In terms of development, the story team would need to trim down the episodic structure of the original series concept and then reconfigure it as a far more linear plot, similar to the first movie. In the first movie, Moana has one main quest, to return the heart of Te Fiti and restore balance to nature. That sounds like a plot arranged for a traditional film. On the other hand, Moana going to various islands to explore their landscape and cultures sounds far more like the episodic narrative that better fits the structural needs of a TV series. And that, I'm guessing, is what needed to be changed to create a successful film. I think a lot of the success of Moana 2 will depend on how well the production team did with rearranging the narrative structure of the project for a different type of presentation. In comparison, over in the land of Alien, Romulus was always going to be a standalone movie. Disney just shifted where it was going to be released from Hulu as a streaming original to the big screen. I'm guessing that the effects budget most likely was increased a little, but to make that move, the story and the script for the Alien film didn't need to be reworked in any meaningful way. Anyway, I'm guessing this is the element to watch with Moana 2 when it comes out in November. And to close out this episode, I have some shorter notes on Disney films still coming out in 2024 and in 2025. First up, Elio. Elio appears to have had a major cast and story shakeup. At the 2022 D23 Expo, Elio was presented as the story of a boy who is mistaken by visiting aliens to be the leader of Earth, with part of the emotional drama focused between Elio and his mother, played then by America Ferreira. In the version that was presented at this year's D23, the emotional drama is now arranged between Elio and his aunt, played by Zoe Saldana. So something large has happened here in the arrangement of the story, though I'm not sure exactly what. Even for industry watchers, it was a surprise to learn earlier this month that America Ferreira was gone from the project, as was her character. Next, the Marvel films. After a year of minimal content, which I think helped Deadpool and Wolverine do very well at the box office, Marvel will now attempt to revive a much larger slate of theatrical and streaming projects in the year ahead. This will start with Agatha All Along this September on Disney Plus and kick into high gear in 2025 with four theatrical releases, and three adult-oriented MCU series on Disney+. 
Of these, I think the project that has the best possibility of doing phenomenal business at the box office is Captain America Brave New World. With its familiar characters and with Harrison Ford playing Thunderbolt Ross, a.k.a. the Red Hulk. But personally... The project that looks most alluring to me is Fantastic Four First Steps, with its setting in the mid-1960s and its presentation of some of the best-known superheroes in the world of comics. There are two big hurdles here. Outside of the world of comics, the characters in the Fantastic Four are not particularly well-known, and the 1960s setting for the project, which fascinates me, also makes the film feel a little more like a period drama, which isn't exactly the sweet spot for the Gen Z crowd, which, as I've mentioned, sees far more movies and theaters than any other age demographic. But the big question, I think, for Marvel overall is this. Without a compelling ongoing multi-film plot, such as had been the case for the narrative lead-up to Thanos and the Infinity Stones, can Marvel sustain an ongoing audience for this much theatrical and streaming content, or will the audience for one Marvel film simply cannibalize the audience for another Marvel creation? In the end, the biggest competition for a Marvel project may ultimately be another Marvel project. And beyond this, will audience members feel lost in the ongoing saga of Marvel if they haven't been able to see all of the films and streaming series over the next year or so? That, I think, is what's really being tested here. How deeply can Marvel saturate the market without cannibalizing its own audience? Another movie to keep an eye on is Mufasa, which is the photorealistic prequel to the photorealistic version of The Lion King. This is another film that likely hits the sweet spot for nostalgia for Gen Z. But the interesting thing here to watch is this. If Mufasa's success brings The Lion King franchise more deeply into the parks, the Lion King franchise, and here I'm including direct-to-video and made-for-TV films, had four hand-drawn features. Admittedly, one of these wasn't great, but the original Lion King remains a high point of the Disney renaissance in terms of storytelling. Lion King also had two animated series. The photorealistic retelling, also called The Lion King, at least as of today, remains the highest grossing animated film of all time. That is, if you group all types of animation together, including CG photorealistic efforts such as here. And I should point out that The Lion King will only remain the highest grossing animated film until Inside Out 2 takes over that spot likely in the next few days. And Mufasa later this year will extend the story of that photorealistic world. I bring this up because this franchise, though 30 years old, still has strong currency in the theaters. I suspect Mufasa will do very well this year. But the thing to watch is this. If Mufasa does well, will Disney then extend The Lion King's presence more into the parks? Announced at D23 was essentially a Lion King area for the second Disney park in Paris, the old Studios Park, which is now being renamed Disney Adventure World. Essentially, instead of Paris getting a new version of Galaxy's Edge, after the American versions with their prequel timeline didn't perform as expected, that park will instead get a Lion King area. Lion King has had some presence in the American parks. Epcot once had a Lion King film on ecology. Animal Kingdom still has its long-running festival stage show. And both DCA and Disneyland at different times had a stage show. But if Mufasa does well, I suspect in the years ahead, we'll start to see more of a presence of the Lion King in the American parks as well, because 30 years is a long time for any franchise to have deep currency at the box office. And lastly, Disney will release another Tron film late in 2025. Straight science fiction is a genre with which Disney has struggled for decades, even though the Disney castle parks all have an entire land focused on near-future science fiction. When I think of successful Disney science fiction films, 
Beyond 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, which was released in 1954 and the original Tron from 1982, I have trouble coming up with strong live-action examples. After those two films, I think the pivot is to Black Hole, Flight of the Navigator, and Escape to Witch Mountain, which in 2024 no longer has a strong following. For the first two Tron movies, the plot was essentially people from the human world were sucked into the computer world of Tron. The plot for the upcoming Tron film is the exact opposite. Entities from the computer world of Tron come into the human world in an attempt to overtake it, which I'm sure will have plenty of overtones with current discussions about AI. But if Disney can finally ground the Tron franchise with a new audience, which I'd say is a pretty big if at this point, this should open the door to seeing a larger presence of Tron IP in the parks as well, as Disney for decades has struggled to connect up its film properties with this section of many castle parks. And with this, I think we have all of the key areas to watch as we move through 2024 and into 2025. But the big issue to follow is not tied to any individual film, but concerns the larger strategy. Next year will mark the five-year anniversary of COVID. It will also be five years since American theaters saw a financial high point at the box office. The big question will be this. Will a large slate of theatrical films from Disney spur a return to something that mostly resembles a pre-COVID box office? Or have people's habits changed so deeply that the average person will only turn out occasionally to an in-person theater, even if there is far more to watch there than there has been for quite some time? That, I think, is the big question to follow, as it will determine how studios define themselves in the years moving forward. I'll be back next week with a new episode. And at least the plan right now is to have next week another story about the history of the Disney company. But at this point, we have carefully looked at many key announcements over eight episodes related to D23 this year, which I think should give all of us a good base of information to use as we move through the coming couple of years. Lastly, as you know, we're an ad-free, listener-supported podcast. We do just two things. Deep dives on stories related to the history of the Disney studio and the parks, and news and analysis of current events as they relate to the Disney company. We are funded entirely by listener contributions, specifically by listeners who join us over on Bandcamp as monthly subscribers. On Bandcamp, you'll find well over 200 episodes that are not available on iTunes or anywhere else. But the best reason to join us there is to support the work we do here and to make sure that this podcast continues to exist. You can support us by becoming a monthly subscriber at dhipodcast.bandcamp.com. I'll also leave a link down in the show notes. So, until next Sunday, this is Todd James Pierce.